Hello, my name is Adeline Xiang. In this video, I'm going to continue my uh, conversation uh, from previous uh, video, from previous chapter, where I talked about my uh, journey with scoliosis, my journey to yoga, and my journey home. I received a couple of emails right after the uh, last week's uh, video uh, when I speak about my journey with scoliosis and how I came about to yoga and how did yoga help and there were yeah a couple of questions and uh, people who responded to emails um, and interested to know a few more things uh, they were asking um, what is my curvature right now with my scoliosis? Do I still experience pain and discomfort? So these are a few things that I might want to um, hopefully share with you in today's video, in this video, where I'll uh, share with you the factual things about my x-ray, about my uh, scoliosis and uh, the years I've been working with it and how I've been working with it. How do I approach yoga? And how do I uh, go about studying and having this uh, deep passion left for yoga uh, now? And how does it support me uh, in my teaching? So first question first, which is probably more straightforward, that's easy for me to uh, answer. Um, and some of you wanted to know because in the last video I mentioned that when I first when I first diagnosed with scoliosis or at least someone told me that I have scoliosis um, I was 13 and at that time my curvature was still kind of in the 20 uh, double curve so S curve so it's uh, it's 20 plus 20 ish and 30 ish uh, uh, in my lumbar spine and at the peak of it when I experienced a lot of pain and it disrupted my sleep, I couldn't sleep well, um, I'm just taking lots of painkillers, um, seeing many different therapists to help uh, fix and treat my, my scoliosis and imbalances. And that was about maybe at age 20, 21, that was at the, towards the end of my university days where there's just increased amount of sitting and studying and and at that time, the peak of my curve was uh, 48 in the thoracic curve, in the upper curve, and 51 in the lower curve. So you can see that it has uh, significantly like, kind of increased um, according to statistics, uh, orthopedic surgeons and, and things, years of statistics. Uh, they do expect uh, curvature to increase any curvature that's above 20, 30 degrees would increase one degree a year, um, even as adult, matured curve throughout life. And as a teenager, as obviously as escalated and uh, doesn't help with lots of um, inactivity because I'm not particularly uh, active during my teenage years because of the pain and uh, discomfort and shame and not wanting to like, participate in too much like movement based things apart from a little bit of dance and, and all, um, swimming, yeah, swimming. So at the peak of it was, I was saying 48 and 51. And that was when I also met yoga, came to yoga. Um, at, at the time, the first earlier few years uh, when I come to yoga, I was just like trying out different things, all different styles that I could put my hands on to. And so I've, I've um, studied um, Ashtanga, but very briefly, probably less than a year. So I wouldn't call myself like I've studied Ashtanga. I've practiced uh, some Ashtanga, Vinyasa flow. I did some uh, shadow yoga for a bit. Um, Scaravelli inspired yoga for a good six, seven years of that. Um, Ayanga yoga uh, for, uh, again, uh, dedicatedly for about five years of that. And some of them cross over, some of them overlap and cross over. And uh, somatic work, 
since I've met Yo uh, uh, Donna actually. So somatic work was introduced to me by Donna and I've uh, since practiced with her for uh, close to 20 years now, 18, 18 years coming up uh, to 19. And yeah, somatic work uh, and restorative yoga. So I've tried different styles and just explore and, and all. So the first few years, um, I did have regular x-rays just to uh, know what's happening, what's uh, shifting in my body and wanting to know how do I help myself with such information. So it's helpful to have information from like uh, external uh, reference like x-rays or report or MRI and things just for me to understand not intending I wasn't intending for any surgery or operation or anything like that but more so to understand where I am where I was and using my body as basically a laboratory so um, understanding and also adapting my practice accordingly and it was a couple of years later that I had an x-ray again. I think I had x-ray a couple of years in between then and up until the last x-ray I had was like three years ago. I still am collecting a few x-rays a few years um, apart and I had at least like three, three sets or three or four sets of other x-rays uh, since the um, uh, 48 degrees, 51 degrees uh, of my curvature and it has improved i cannot remember the exact number but uh, what i can remember was three years ago that was the last x-ray at least the last x-ray was in 2018 and that was um so from 48 it went down to 26 degrees in my thoracic uh, spine upper curve from 51 degrees in my lumbar curve my lower curve it went down to 25 now those are just numbers it may or may not change and it's not important as long as i feel um, manageable with the symptoms of discomfort functionally i'm able to uh, move and support any uh, activity that i like to um, enjoy and since then in fact uh, more than about 15 years ago about 15 years ago I started um, horse riding I went for scuba diving I went for like a lot more active stuff and things that I couldn't even as a younger body as a teenager I wouldn't dream of being able to participate and do um, and the last uh, like on off off more than on I've also tried some like climbing like wall climbing rock climbing kind of thing so those are the things that I could never dream of uh, possible uh, with with scoliosis with my imbalances especially with pain uh, from from before so I was saying the the numbers in terms of the cop angle did shift but more importantly is how I feel positive about living with scoliosis that it actually inspire me to continue my research uh, with this body and through that I have uh, developed a, um, various different programs, intensives to um, bring together a condensed uh, syllabus package and things to be able to share and offer how I work with my scoliosis and imbalances within the body now there was another question before uh, from since my last um, video about whether I still experience pain and discomfort since I've been mentioning there's so much pain that I've been taking painkillers and uh, lots of like muscle relax and rub and, and things often um, to ease my discomfort to be able to even just sleep comfortably through the night I do experience tension, in fact, um, modulating of tension throughout the day. And more importantly is for me to understand what is my threshold that I'm able to keep up with in terms of activity, in terms of even like strength training or uh, my gym or my spin classes. 
um, yes, I've now got the spin classes and I really enjoyed it. Um, pain is basically to me a signal to the brain that the co body communicates with the brain, um, expressing an information, a piece of information. Whether that is to take care of it, whether that is to stretch it, relax it, massage it, do something about it, or maybe enjoy it and, and all. And yes, I do um, on and off, I wouldn't call it pain. I do have a stronger sensation sometimes or less intense sensation other times. But what I, I do notice is how I'm able to recognize the smallest escalation of, of discomfort in my body as it comes up. So for example, knowing that if I'm traveling, I'm having to sit in the airplane seat for like extended hours, long hours, especially when I travel to Asia and all, um, or probably lugging my luggages like on off conveyor belt and, and um, custom and, and things. I know that it is a strain on my back to have that amount of lifting and activity, especially this is not something that I do daily. If I've been like weight training daily, probably different. Maybe I should. Um, but most of that I will probably expect or know that uh, potentially I might need to do a lot more release work um, before, the, uh, before the exertion of maybe traveling or uh, maybe a, I'll go for a hike, a full day hike, um, hiking. And also after post, post activity. So post my travel, when I arrive, when I um, get to where I want to go to, um, uh, that I'm able to relieve the discomfort in my body, in the discomfort that is, whether it's my shoulder or lower back, upper back, uh, just to find some evenness in how the body then regain function and uh, easefulness and comfort. So in short, pain or discomfort, as long as this is still a human flesh body, there will be sensory receptors, there will be nociceptors to detect uh, discomfort, pain as a protective mechanism, as a way of communicating to me that it is nearing close to my threshold that it's time to either reduce the load or back off or rest, take rest. And that is in fact important. It's, it's a friendly message for me to be able to respond. Um, otherwise, I'll just push through and then get into a place of strain and then eventually injury and so on, so on. So yes, in terms of those of you who ask me about whether I still experience back, back pain, um, it happens once in a while but very manageable and usually is when I push through my threshold push or, or probably close to my threshold and very very seldom that I would uh, allow myself to go there and I'll, I'll share with you in a moment also how I approach my physical practice my asana practice in order to modulate how do I serve and nourish myself with my practice, especially movement practice, uh, in specifically addressing uh, my imbalances or any uneven tension health uh, in my body. Uh, what I've also noticed is the there are persistent areas that are my weakest link we all have different parts and some of you might say oh no it's my shoulders and someone might be oh no it's my neck on one side more than the other side i do experience tension more so on my left side lower back so there's a built up of uh, muscle tension in that area just to compensate and just to navigate my upright position throughout the day from the like 26 degrees 25 degrees of my uh, imbalances in fact i'm actually quite um uh celebratory i'm actually celebrating that the curvature now if it could just maintain at this number like 26 and 25 be just because the numbers are pretty balanced that's my hypothesis just because they are pretty balanced which means that there is uh, less loading on one side they self-balance themselves um, with the upper curve and lower curve 
which there will still be some discrepancy, but as much as possible between the left and right side, there is some harmony that um, the upper curve and lower curve, it's about balance. I don't know if that is um, that has anything to do with it, but I could definitely relate to how I feel when I sit for my meditation. Um, for, for years, when I meditate, I would sit on a chair uh, the earlier years and sitting on the floor simply one minute that's about it one minute I can feel my back I can feel like just everything uh, before I get to like actually the mind every physical part of my body is like rejecting sitting on the floor uh, comfortably and um, I start sitting in Varasan to start so my pelvis in, is in more neutral position but over years I'm noticing that I could sit uh, a little bit longer uh, comfortably now that is not a measurement of um, progression or advancement, but simply noticing what is my ability and threshold to sustain optimal support and comfort um, without the body complaining, rejecting. And I'm finding it more comfortable to do one hour sitting. That's usually the time that I like, uh, I would like naturally even with or without the um, timer that I like to sit, I actually find the intensive training, intensive uh, like extended hours of sitting when I was uh, in, on my Vipassana 10-day uh, silent meditation retreat. That was uh, when there was a lot of sitting. There's probably like 10 to 11 hours of sitting every day for 10 days. Um, the silent bit was easy. It wasn't difficult for me. I could just like be with myself and, and all. But it was really the um, long hours of sitting um, with minimal, because we're not encouraged to do a lot of uh, movement practices, yoga and all. So uh, with minimal, just re some releasing and things in my room, just quietly and sitting most of the time for meditation. And that was really... Um, allow me to establish a more settled, stable seat so that I can continue with that uh, at home for an hour at a time and, and all. So that's comfortable for me. I'm hoping that that will, uh, that that's partly uh, the curvature that is actually self-balancing itself. You can imagine if it's just one curve and then the other, the other part, the upper part is straight, then I'll be probably more strenuous and lopsided to be able to just uh, maintain my vertical position. So that's a, a little bit about my curvature and uh, pain and pain management, how I manage my pain. Like I said, it's nothing uh, to shout about, but more so for me to share with you how I continue to investigate and be interested in um, what works and what not and adapting my practice accordingly recognizing the threshold of um, uh, my practice and sensation listening to the sensation in my body so now about there was a question uh, that I received how do I know if I'm practicing correctly I probably rephrase it to how do I know if um, I'm practicing beneficially for uh, for my structure, maybe for how I um, yeah, just the imbalances within my body and how do I manage it? How did yoga work for me, and how do I study or approach yoga in a way to keep it fresh and uh, inspired and uh, interested to eventually share and teach and uh, to have a special interest in scoliosis and helping others with imbalances of scoliosis. Um, so firstly, when I come to my practice, I think um, uh, some of you might have uh, access to my YouTube channel. I've recently posted my self-practice, daily self-practice, 10-day challenge. So you can take a look at like the pattern of my practice. There's really, I say a pattern, but actually the non-pattern, the, the formlessness of expressing movement. 
from uh, the body mind centering work that I uh, enjoy uh, exploring but really is going in small steps and bite sizes so in the movement I've learned to gradually shy away from extreme range of movement and also slower so that I could hear the first sign of sensation in my body before I kind of jump over that sensation and move into a place that my body might not be ready uh, that much that soon. And I actually have um, increased stability and reduce my range of movement in some joints, some parts of my body in order to have more support um, than just hypermobility in some joints and tighter in other parts. So finding some harmony between like tight boards and uh, flexibility, it's about harmony in expressing movement than actually just increasing range of movement when I come to practice. And what I find uh, that I'm able to listen to more attentively is when I pause every now and then momentarily. So after a position or movement, I would just pause and notice how my body, how, how the, the, the aftertaste of the movement, of the posture settle in my body. If the body likes it, rejects it, or how, how do I, can I up the game or move a little bit closer, further into it, deepen into the pose, or to back off slightly to um, maybe completely change another uh, direction of movement or position. So taking it slowly is definitely one thing that has uh, slowly educated me in terms of how to negotiate my threshold, negotiate uh, sensation in my body. Yes, there might be certain posture, position, in fact, there's lots written um, on online about this posture, this practice or sequence, it's uh, uh, for scoliosis specifically. I personally, I think that it's not about what to do or what to practice as to what posture or sequence but how you practice it could be the same plank pose it could be the same down dog or um, it could be shavasana in itself resting and how do we modify adapt and um, find a way to support the body so that it can express energetically in harmony so that it's beyond just a muscular discrepancy to find some evenness even expression of my energetic um, body and experience. So that's um, in general how I would approach my practice, at least physical practice. But I'm really taking, uh, appreciating and taking refuge in my restorative practices. My restorative practices where I have time to actually turn inward and rest that helps to recalibrate my nerves, like literally my nerves, recalibrates my nervous system, really. Um, it helps me to be a little bit more attentive and clear because I have the capacity, because I, I, when I'm well rested, I have the capacity to be able to at be attentive and uh, compassionate towards my practice. So I'm, I'm, I'm not approaching my practice with just like no pain, no gain. Rather, that's just compassion in expressing movement from moment to moment. And that often doesn't quite um, easily manifest when I'm tired, when I'm depleted, uh, when I'm frustrated. So restorative yoga really helps to recalibrate um, mental clarity and uh, definitely my energetic uh, expression, evenness in my energetic feel of expressing uh, myself through movement or through resting. Um, it's definitely a huge component where I take refuge for my emotional comfort. Um, this is a huge part that I include in every of my practice every day and introduce it to my students as well, especially with the scoliosis program and 
intensive that I offer, there's always a complement that I would include uh, restorative as not the only practice or the most important practice, but it's definitely a big component to be able to support the healing process of uh, working with uh, or therapeutically working with the body. And how I keep my practice uh, refreshed, some of you, in fact many of you know that my longtime uh, teacher are Jada Hansen Lasseter and Donna Fari. They are still my inspiration, my mentor, and I do uh, with much gratitude receive lots of support from them through um, face to face, uh, one-to-one -one time with them, through emails, through assisting them, through um, supporting their events where I could um, be in the presence of, or yeah, presence of their beingness. But what I, what, how I approach is I do see my, uh, my main teachers, I would just call them my main teachers, every year, at least for a couple of weeks. And every year I want to challenge myself and approach or probably invite in another voice, another teacher or another completely different style or approach to, to what I'm used to habitually because um, there are certain habits that we undertake that it's probably familiarity and we just continue on doing it. But every year I would make sure that I would study with one other teacher of a, maybe a completely different uh, approach or at least listen to different um, approaches. So I've spent uh, different, in, not in uh, order, uh, with uh, Elise Miller, Roger Cole, lovely, lovely, I would love to study more with Roger Cole, uh, Richard Rosen, my inspiration. Um, I've studied with Alaric. I've studied with like just different, and also I've uh, done to ex done extensively uh, body mind centering. So last few years, I've taken a more formal study with the school of body mind centering, which is a somatic movement education program uh, by Bonnie Bembridge Cohen. So Bonnie, it's definitely one of my inspiration. And also in the last decade, I've uh, landed myself with uh, Yoga Nidra. So I've opened up doors where there are my regular main teacher practice and study, but there are also every year I wanna attend either a, a workshop or um, expose myself maybe through books or other one-to-one uh, -one, face to face uh, practices with another uh, teacher yeah, or modality movement modality and I was just about to say yoga nidra um, I've studied also yoga nidra with different teachers and this is how I like to study so if, if you're asking about like how I approach and study yoga I like to study the spectrum of it at the beginning it's a li little bit like um, <laughs> I call this like yoga shopping like workshop from workshop to workshop but really, just within Yoga Nidra itself, I've spent some time with Total Yoga Nidra with Uma. I've spent some time with uh, Richard Miller. I've spent some time with like just different modalities, traditions, Himalayan uh, Yoga Nidra, and different books, and um, did even extensive training also with uh, some of these uh, approach and modalities. Before I then um, decide uh, whether I want to go deeper into a, a particular um, expression of it or um, a syllabus or uh, approach, which in for Yoga Nidra at least, that I have then decided to go further deep in my studies uh, in the I rest, I rest approach which is integrative, integrative restoration. It's, it's um, yoga nidra practice, which focuses on welcoming and meeting 
and greeting myself or the person, the practitioner, where I am in that moment, not intended for fixing or changing or any sort of um, wanting anything different, but rather to fully embody, embrace the experiences, the fluctuation. Um, and that allows me to fully accept and receive myself and all the imperfection of myself in that moment, whether that is manifest in a form of pain or physical pain or emotional pain, that it is something that I can truly be myself and reconnect with my inner beingness. And since just a sense of pure awareness it is uh, when I come to I rest uh, practices, which is uh, an area that I continue to share with some of you have uh, probably attended my yoga nidra classes or courses that it's a bit of practice that is not about psychotherapy is not about therapeutically kind of changing or fixing it's just about receiving and meeting yourself and that really again deepen my healing process of how do i truly receive myself uh, especially the imperfections of myself and to be able to see more clearly how, when and how the ego, the little ego self or the big ego self expresses um, in different moments. Yeah. Yeah, there is a question about, uh, or probably a statement, um, yeah, Catherine was saying that I seem to, uh, you seem to have, I'll just read, you seem to have pulled your discipline together for your teaching and the yoga shopping part can divert one from listening to one's own inner teacher, as Uma would say. Any advice for pulling all these teachings and influences into your own true practice and teaching? Okay. Yes, through ultimately through your inner innate wisdom. It's not something that someone could tell you, even right now, I'm, I'm not telling you. In fact, I can only share with you what I have experienced and see if there are bits and parts and blocks of it that resonate with you. And if it lands well on with you, explore, give it a taste explore it and that's how I'm, I'm saying this because that's how I actually did uh, learn and study and how I came to find a more complete holistic healing of, of scoliosis of imbalances of uh, managing uh, emotional fluctuations and mental disturbances <laughs> disturbances in the force to actually approach in bite size, small doses, and see how, and give time to yourself and see how that land uh, in my body, in my experience over a period. And to continue watching if it's the ego that wants to do more and grasp more, more information, yeah, that part of me that is, um, that wants the desire. Desire is important, that um, motivates us. But at the same time, knowing that, okay, take a pause. And you see this often, that I would demonstrate also in, in my teaching. Every now and then, I might just like... And take a breather and just to reflect upon the volume and words I've just like spoken in the last few minutes or last half an hour. Um, it, it allows... Even in my teaching, it allows me time to slow me down in how I approach my student and also to slow me down to observe myself. And if there's any secret, probably the slowness of it. Slowness, not just sluggishness and uh, inertia, but slowness, but attentive slowness. So there is a relaxed effort yeah, I've been using that term for a bit now, relaxed effort, where there is attentiveness to it, 
is not passive uh, falling back into not doing. So observing how that um, expresses in your words, in your speaking, in your practice, continue to observe. The moment there is an urge to keep going, keep going, can you just pause for another, like just 10 seconds, or maybe if you can manage five seconds, five seconds and see how that moment of silence and stillness have a resonance in what you have just said or do. And this is um, how I practice or train myself um, during the day, throughout the day. I would have be having a conversation and when there's a moment of my ego that wants to defend or say something and and um, yeah, especially if there's a, something that I'm passionate and I disagree, that's that's the moment. That is the moment that I watch myself pause, like literally there's a pause button, a pause button to take a breath and then speak from there. Maybe I'll still speak the same thing that I wanted to say, but from a very different intention or attitude or energy of expressing my same point of view. It could still be my same point of view. I'm not saying that it might be different. Yeah. Okay. And definitely um, I appreciate Yes, attending workshops for inspiration. That's what I uh, did in my earlier years with my teacher also. But what I've noticed, uh, especially with my main teacher, with both Donna and Judith, that assisting my teacher, just simply being in the presence and assisting and observing and be attentive from an observer witness point of view, as well as supporting the space, has a complete different dimension of learning, of learning and therefore inspiration. And I highly value assisting my teacher. I highly value um, having the opportunity and honor to be able to be in that capacity to support an event, to support even uh, some of my colleague. It doesn't need to just be your, your main teacher to support other uh, of your colleague and peers. Um, and and that in itself, to be an observer, has a different angle of learning, uh, studying. Yeah, and I really appreciate and value that. And of course, I take an interest to study, um, especially if there's an area that I'm particularly interested in. I'm interested in, yes, that's scoliosis, and also I'm naturally drawn to understanding also a little bit more factual things like science of like uh, anatomy and physiology and, and so on. So I do study a little bit myself, uh, a lot myself, through books uh, or courses. But also mentorship, mentorship with my teacher and uh, having that opportunity to apprentice and have conversation with my teacher one-to-one -one time with, with them to be able to flush out things that it's kind of that I've like kind of turned my eye away from somewhere and they um, are able to just okay can you see can you see now just behind that curtain just look that way and they're not particularly putting things into me like putting new things into me but rather allowing me and um, I'm sure you um, many of you resonate or probably heard where uh, the teacher uh, points out the inner light within us and, and all that inner light within us that flaming It's it's there already, but it can also be cultivated You could actually grow its vibrancy and the aliveness of it and that's how I if there's anything measure my Advancement in terms of how it then come out as a response and how I would um, present myself to the world but definitely, um, yeah, having uh, support with uh, a regular teacher is really important. If that's uh, if that's uh, um, 
someone that you could resonate, you resonate with, and um, email email the teacher and ask them for uh, support. I mean, what's the worst case? Uh, just say yes, no, and maybe support through colleague and peers. That's also uh, one of the things that I find really helpful and inspiring for me. And I make it my business. I make it a point. I make it my business to connect one-to-one -one time. I know there might be lots of like parties, community um, meetings, and studio meetings with other teachers, but it never replaces like one-to-one -one time where I can have um, the full attention of the other person and giving full attention to the person in front of me. Um, and some of you uh, know that I do meet up with you one-to-one. -one over lunch and over like now across the screen just to be in the presence of each other and talk about anything yoga and plus plus everything and that often also allows me to see from a different perspective and allow me a moment of reflection and that helps me study and be a student and student and student and practitioner of yoga and ultimately, I speak a lot about reflection and, and, and all, and I believe that the word wisdom, how do I study and like gain wisdom? How do I like grow a few more gray hair to gain this wisdom? Maybe the gray hair is a reflection of wisdom. Maybe that's the truth, <laughs> the growing old part. Um, wisdom is it arises when I reflect upon knowledge so I can be gaining uh, lots of knowledge like just uh, hundreds of books and, and uh, journals that I read write and and all it's just knowledge whilst to truly translate that into an embodied um, that I really Embody it, own own it in myself, in 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 this body. It's true. Yes, embodiment. That's the word. Embodiment of um, the information and reflection upon it. Embodying and reflecting upon my experiences through studying, through different channel that I receive this information from my teacher, from books, from workshops and classes. And it's definitely helpful that I have um, uh, constant encouragement and support from uh, a mentor. And I encourage and I encourage you whether that is a peer uh, mentor or support that you have or find someone that uh, you really resonate with uh, and have a more regular like, relationship with. It might be your teacher, it might be someone else as, as your mentor. So uh, my daughter has started doing the scroff physiotherapy from today. See lumbar curve. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah another modality that I I have um, witnessed. I have observed uh, some of the approach uh, by Catherine Scroff method. Um, I think there's lots of value, especially for uh, a growing teenager. Yeah, that's definitely. But myself. I've not uh, been through, I've, I've worked with people who has been through and pre and post, um, but I myself have not been through the uh, four week program, so I can't speak directly, but from what I um, uh, observe and understand and read, um, I think there's a lots of value in uh, addressing the imbalances um, and convexity, concavity, but what I was craving and hoping that there will be a little bit more of is releasing the releasing and dismantling of tension which is different from stretching the releasing part which actually comes with the non-ego state of compassion that's where completes so it simply completes the healing process of, of my scoliosis, at least from my experience, how um, it's 
and I've uh, approached it also from the Ayanga method of working with scoliosis. Some of you uh, know there are quite a few um, uh, well-known Ayanga teachers who teach scoliosis, uh, at least teach yoga for scoliosis specifically. And also, again, there's a component that, uh, yes, th there are lots that overlap and I really appreciate it. And there, are, there is this component of beingness and not doing. That component really completes my healing process uh, when approaching practicing with scoliosis from a therapeutic perspective. At least, again, from my humble opinion. Um, there are many times that, uh, in fact, years ago, there are many times that I've actually desire or probably crave and want to have more information and knowledge. I'm still on that topic of like, how do I learn and approach yoga in order to come up with like how it really truly means to me and how it works, works out for healing. And I thought of studying go to physiotherapy school, I've thought of doing an osteopathy course, I've thought of doing an, uh, a, a master's MSc <laughs> for anatomy or uh, for, for uh, yoga philosophy study at the SOAS. I've, I've, I've thought of lots and uh, it is a commitment and some of you know if you have been through it is a commitment in terms of time, resources, energy, um, um, uh, financially, like it is an, uh, a lot of mm, um, yeah contribution to bringing this together. And what I've uh, then uh, um, reflected and let it settle and sit with me for like years is that I am no scientist, I am not particularly academic, uh, I in fact, I mean I did go to university, I have my uh, degree, but I'm really valuing and seeing the potential in embodied experiences. And that's where I want to spend my resources, my time, my energy, uh, my finances, like in just simply embodying experiences. Because ultimately, once it's in there, it's in there, rather than it's in here. And being in here, I still have to go through another phase of translating it into here. And therefore, I um, took time to just dive in. That was like the last like decade now. Um, and, and, and more uh, into body mind centering work to actually really bring in the somatization of how it manifests and express and find its innate intelligence to, to reveal its innate intelligence within the body. I teach it that I teach that and I um, hope that that would navigate help students uh, my students to navigate to find that within themselves. And therefore, some of you who have like been to my classes know that very often that there will be an inquiry. There is some context to give you some guide ropes as to how to how to practice and approach that day's class. But very much um, soon that I'm inviting the body to move itself, inviting the self-suggesting um, movement, and uh, whether that is. Uh, pausing in a position or movement to be able to find what's most nourishing for the body, what's most nourishing for the mind. And I've also spent years uh, then embodying and practicing, it's just experiencing and just do the hours, I call it just do the hours of my meditation uh, instead of going to graduate school, instead of going to like post postgraduate school um, to simply just spend my hours being in meditation, thousands of hours of just sitting for meditation and hopefully it gets into my cells and hopefully it's there now. But what I truly believe is that um, whatever is embodied is literally in the cells. You can't, you, you, you can't, no one can take it away from you. 
and it's literally just in in within your being so from knowledge to um, experiences to actually embodying the wisdom of it and that's how I uh, approach my yoga studies so yes you can do a little bit of yoga shopping and then um, settle into somewhere you feel comfortable with and go deeper into um, an area of interest or a, a style or an approach or a study with um, a teacher that re you resonate with that uh, someone that the teacher as much as they are like teaching they are really holding the space for your um, unfolding holding the space and being the witness and this is what I also find it really fascinating now teaching across the screen that I encourage students to uh, even if I can't see the full like uh, uh, movement that you keep the screen on so that I can be your sacred mirror and witness your practice and be present for you and with you and, yeah. so yeah it's it's really, thinking back, it's really just the ego that wants the certificate for me. <laughs> At least when I, when I actually think back, it's like, okay, the ego self that feels insecure, that feels fearful that if I haven't got another title or another piece of paper and things, it's, it's, it's that little bit that wanted to have one more thing. Um, but of course, there is also craving for knowledge, which um, I do that's why I was saying I do my self-study I do um, uh, yeah just study self-study or maybe if it's helpful for some of you go take a to take a course and to take a short course or something that to give you a little bit more guide ropes so going to a, a course or a, a a training or a workshop like when, when I attempt to design this uh, yoga scoliosis program as 10 modules, it's bite-sized. I, I wanted it to be accessible and bite-sized for people. And at the same time, to as a takeaway, as like literally a takeaway, um, where you can take home and digest it and enjoy it and eat it um, in your own time, to be able to take time to embody before the next chunk of information, before the next chunk of information. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Barbara, for saying that. For sh Barbara sharing that uh, somatic practice with me every week is very nourishing. And um, nourishing is not something that I've given you. It's, it's something that you have chosen in that moment. When you have chosen the appropriate practice or movement in that moment, it simply nourishes you at a level that is not something one can do it for you. And yeah, so thank you. <laughs> Connect with your Sangha, get support from others. Um, I recognize that my existence is in the interdependent to all around me. You across the screen right now, all my students, my colleagues and peers, um, all the people who inspire me around me that uh, who I've met or not met, yoga, non-yoga, uh, oh, non-yoga, I don't know what that is, but yeah, yo within the yoga industry or outside and, and all. Um, so, Take time for yourself. Just give yourself ample space, compassion. There's no hurry because there's a lifetime of doing this. That's all I would like to share for the second half of my 
conversation, those of you who were interested in my journey of uh, how my scoliosis has manifested and in terms of pain and all, and also how I approach and study yoga in a way that would support my growth uh, and healing. Not just the fixing part, but actually healing as a human, as a human being, as a person. From the more visible parts of me, x-rays and 26 degrees, 25 degrees, numbers, numbers, to actually feeling, feeling confident and feeling hopeful. I'm just having this immense passion um, to continue practice yoga, to be able to share it with those of you who are interested to still be here listening till now, to have deeper interconnectedness, to reconnect with myself and connectedness with all beings around me, all my interactions. And that's my yoga. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here in my life across the screen. Namaste. Thank you, thank you for those of you who has been here for a while now. <laughs> and for those of you who are interested, this Saturday I'm doing two workshops. You can check it out on my website. They are part of the Scoliosis module, but all welcome. It's really about what I've discussed today. Mental and emotional resilience. As the morning workshop and afternoon workshop is about rest and relaxation so hopefully some of you could join me bye for now <laughs>